our webinar, our third webinar on Hurricane Sandy on mold exposure and health effects. This program is brought to you by the New Jersey New York Hazardous Materials Worker Training Center, which is supported by NIHS, the New York New Jersey Education and Research Center, which is supported by NIOSH, and the New Jersey Public Health Training Center, which is supported by HRSA. You'll be able to ask questions. You can click on the chat bubble that's at the top of your screen um, at any point during the, the webinar, and we'll get to the questions at the end. So please uh, write them to us throughout the webinar. Today we have Dr. Jack Caravanos from Hunter College, uh, Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Program. He is going to talk about exp uh, health exposure uh, with mold, and Rob Lombach, uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute. And he is going to talk about diagnosing and treatment. So we'll start with Professor Caravanos. Yes, thank you, Mitch. I'm glad to be here again. Uh, I, as an industrial hygienist and professor of environmental health, I want to cover some of the exposure aspects of, uh, of mold in the specifically environmental mold, specifically as related to uh, Hurricane Sandy. I will talk about some mold spores, fragments, some aerodynamics, a qualitative versus a qualitative assessment, followed by exposure pathways, which will then lead us directly into the health effects. Uh, as, uh, as you may know, mold spores are uh, ubiquitous. They will land on surfaces, giving the environmental conditions of uh, temperature uh, food source and moisture, they will germinate. Uh, the vegetative mycelium will penetrate the substrate looking for food, releasing enzymes. Some of these are the microbial VOCs that you'll hear about later. Uh, and then, of course, the aerial mycelium, which is generating more spores through the hyphae and uh, conidiophores. Uh, essentially, my message today is that the whole intent of this creature of, uh, of mold is germination of very fine particles, spores. So in some ways, this is uh, completely um, uh, in line with industrial hygiene practice in that we're trying to prevent something that this creature is generating naturally. If you look at these uh, mold cultures under um, a Petri dish, in this case, mold extract agar, you see that within a short amount of time, three, four days, visible cultures will uh, be generated from a single spore. In this particular slide, you could see uh, about approximately five different mold species, a couple of yeast, the mucoid material uh, at about 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock. That pink one is a, a yeast. Uh, and again, I've said it before that you cannot look at these cultures and quickly identify the material uh, as far as what species is growing. And this whole idea that you could look at this black material on a curtain and say, oh, gee, that's stachybotrys is not true. This cannot uh, happen so uh, readily. Uh, within a few days, the mycelium uh, can quickly take over, and this is where many things are happening. Uh, tremendous amounts of conidia. The spores are, of course, dying to be released to reimplant and more substrate and grow, as well as uh, hyphae and mycelial uh, fragments that are also released. And whether it's viable or non-viable, we have the same dilemma that these particles having pro, pro, uh, protonaceous material can trigger various responses. Uh, the particle sizes, as I've said uh, in the past, are sort of ideal for inhalation, very small particles going usually past the nasal cavities into the uh, 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 upper and uh, lower respiratory tracts. And again, uh, just to keep... Uh, this in perspective, that mold spores have been here as long, if not longer, than humans, so they are something we have evolved with. But there are situations where exposure can be very, very serious. Um, our, quantita our qualitative assessment is rather simple. Here you could see, to at least a trained eye, that these white blotches are the mycelium from the mold spores. This is the aerial mycelium that grows uh, uh, away from the substrate. And the whole purpose here is to generate these conidia and uh, trans release them and transport them. However, what you don't see is the vegetative uh, uh, mycelium, which, mycelium, which is penetrating the wood pores. And, of course, the more porous, the deeper this can go. 
And this is why we're always cautious about chlorine and whether it can actually kill uh, the mycelium that penetrates the porous nature of the uh, substrate. Uh, very often it's uh, quite obvious. Uh, here you have different colors of uh, mold, which can specify different species. But again, just looking at this cannot give you a, an assessment of what's actually growing there. So the second quantitative assessment that industrial hygienists uh, do, and I should say cautiously do, is assessment of uh, viable uh, mold spores. These are mold spores which will germinate into cultures, colony-forming units. The Anderson Air Sampler uh, impactor is very common in this. Uh, but, but within the last uh, five, ten years, we've seen more and more uh, use of total, more, uh, total spore counts using uh, the aerosol uh, cassettes or other impactors, the Burkhardt sampler, which is impacting particles onto a grease slide, which then is enumerated. Of course, the spore traps shown on the right here with the Zephon, a portable unit, uh, is measuring total uh, material, viable and non-viable. And, and primarily for clearance of mold remediation projects, uh, we are using total spore counts as the dominant uh, uh, sort of uh, assessment. Uh, what you're looking at is a house. Uh, this, these are some numbers. I've, I've simplified them. Uh, the units here are uh, spores per cubic meter. So in the lower level of house uh, one, you see that we have 33,000 uh, spores per cubic meter. The upstairs of the home, which was not flooded, and this is pro this data is about two weeks old, it was uh, uh, 8,000, and the outdoors at 1,600. And while we don't look at the actual value of these numbers, we compare the ratios between the contaminated indoor and the outdoor environment as one measure of, of uh, exposure and cleanliness. Uh, a more dramatic case is uh, this one, and I'll show you the full data in a second. One million, over one million spores per cubic meter in the lower level. The upper level also had some contamination, probably through air migration, of uh, 260,000, while the indoors is 760. Uh, keep in mind, this is a logarithmic scale. If you look to the left, well, the previous slide was arithmetic. So the, this is actually uh, quite, quite significant, uh, just by looking at the outdoors at 760. Uh, if you look more carefully at this uh, house number two, and if you could make the date out on the top left, you'll see this is uh, December 14th. So this is uh, fresh from the field. We have a couple of issues, right? There's the first floor, second floor, and the outdoor numbers, uh, rows one, two, and three. And if we look at what's growing, if we just focus on uh, Aspen, Aspergillus penicillin, as a... Um, uh, a common reporting unit of one material because it's very difficult to uh, differentiate these species um, uh, microscopically. Uh, there we have uh, a certain amount, uh, 75,000 counts of fungal structures extrapolating to over a million or so uh, colony, uh, spores per cubic meter and uh, representing 99% of what was on that spore trap. Uh, second floor, you see there's uh, also very high numbers. You also see uh, cladosporium. Uh, cladosporium is a uh, very common outdoor mold. And, of course, the uh, outdoor sample, you see a, a much lower number of penicillin aspergillus uh, counts there. And also, if you focus on the what's growing, not just how many are growing or how many spores are present, but the distribution of the... Um, the species, you do see that the outdoors is very uh, heterogeneous as opposed to the indoor samples, which are very uh, homogeneous, or at least focused on just a few species. Um, uh, please don't ask me to explain the stachybotrys numbers. Uh, I think what this says is stachybotrys is out there, and given the right conditions, it can grow. Uh, it takes a little longer. It takes more moisture, but stachybotrys, of course, is found outdoors and indoors. So in something like this, you have tremendous uh, possibility of disturbing these uh, mycelial uh, growths uh, and releasing conidia, the spores. 
and the levels can go sky high. So getting levels of 30,000, 50,000, 75,000 during a muckout, such as what you see here, is quite possible. Also, the spores are still uh, releasing on this wet material and will affect the entire neighborhood. So doing indoor and outdoor samples with such uh, extensive debris is, is sort of a, a bit of a challenge. I'm not quite sure how scientific we're getting there. And just want to keep, uh, uh, keep in mind that mold does have a, uh, a growth period. Here you see that uh, when the warmer weather comes, uh, mold will take off. It's temperature dependent usually. And uh, given enough moisture, April and May, you do get the release of more spores. Um, and you see it tails off again in the winter. And if you look at the data here, you see averages of 20,000, 30,000. So I guess what I'm saying is if an industrial hygienist tells you you have you know, 30,000 mold spores, um, that this may be normal for a particular area in the U.S. during a particular season or month. So we need to keep these numbers. Numbers of, of 800,000 can very easily scare people, but again, uh, this is not necessarily a sign of a, a health threat. Uh, going into ex, uh, a human pathway assessment, exposure assessment, this is, of course, a classic adaptation from a Kassara and Dual textbook. Uh, we use this uh, in teaching environmental toxicology extensively. And you're probably wondering, uh, where is mold uh, exposure dominant? And, of course, we, we do eat contaminated food, maybe even moldy bread or moldy cheese. And there's a certain risk there, but of course this program is more focused on indoor uh, exposures and primarily airborne. But when you sort this all out, and Dr. Lombach will describe this even better, it ends up, it's primarily a very narrow uh, uh, organ system. Uh, the material is inhaled, deposited in the lungs, and, there, and health effects thereafter. So we don't see much um, in the way of dermal or ingestion hazards for environmental exposure, but again, this will lead us into uh, the next part of this program. And uh, just keeping in mind indoor levels, such as a contaminated porous material like this, during some of these uh, cleanouts, uh, will just continue. So once the material is uh, no longer growing, it's, the spores are still there. So some of the important points I want to leave you with, uh, keep in mind that these spores want to be airborne. That's their mission in life, is to be dispersed, reseed, find more media conditions, and grow again and produce more. That's their, uh, their reason to be. Uh, these are very small particles, 2 to 10 microns. However, um, uh, not all of them can reach the alveoli. And I'll let uh, Dr. Lombach expand on that point. Some particles may break apart and be more respirable than others. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, moles are growing um, uh, creatures that uh, are, are releasing toxins, so microbial uh, VOCs such as alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, uh, a variety of uh, VOCs are released, and this is the odor related associated with an active mold growth. Uh, once these materials uh, die off, that odor does not uh, appear. However, the material is still present. As opposed to beta-glucans, which is a chemical found in the spores, which is sometimes used as a, uh, a measure of, of uh, a chemical indicator of mold exposure. Uh, finally, mycotoxins is a, is a whole other area, very narrow in, its, uh, in, in where it's being produced and the seriousness of this. Finally, I just want to remind you that these spores last a long time. They don't dry out. They're made to survive. And essentially, uh, uh, destroying them is, is, is very, very difficult. Uh, with that, I think I want to hand it over to uh, Dr. Lombach, who will talk about recognition, diagnosis, and treating mold-related disease. Okay, Robert. Well, thank you, uh, Jack. And I wanted to also uh, thank the sponsors for giving me the opportunity to speak here today and uh, Mitchell Rosen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a physician. I see patients in uh, the environmental and occupational health uh, clinic at the Environmental and Occupational Health uh, Institute, the OC next door here. And this is something, uh, mold-related health concerns that I'm very, uh, that I care about because we see a lot of patients uh, approximately at least once every uh, week uh, 
We've seen hundreds of patients over the last five or ten years with mold-related concerns. And you may see many different claims and many different reports of mold-related health concerns in the media. And I want to put into perspective those sort of concerns about health. They're relatively limited. Some are more serious, but fortunately more rare. Others are more common. In cases like the current situation where there's flooding or other incidents where there's a lot more potential for mold growth, people are more concerned. But as Dr. Karabanos mentioned, you know, mold's been with us for eons, and we see patients regularly who have mold-related concerns from leaky plumbing or other situations in their homes and also workplaces. So I'd like to identify and differentiate the specific conditions that have been related to mold exposure and then provide some perspective to understand the relative proportion or relative importance of the different conditions. And I want to sort of review the basic information about how these conditions are diagnosed and how they can be prevented and treated. So there are basically four ways that mold can affect health, both allergic conditions, allergic responses, which can include responses like allergic rhinitis or hay fever, which are common experiences that many people have, irritation-type responses, which can occur from the mold VOCs that Dr. Karabanos mentioned, or perhaps other substances in the mold. One substance is beta-glucan, which is a cell wall component of the mold, which may cause inflammation. And these irritation responses are typically in those parts of the body where the molds can have contact, so in the respiratory tract, in the lining of the nose, the throat, and the lungs is where we might see these irritation responses. And then infection or colonization is very rare. So I think generally people may be concerned that mold can grow on materials and that mold may take hold in someone's body and cause an infection. But mold is adapted to break down, in its role in nature, non-living materials, and our immune systems are very well equipped to resist infection with mold. But in some circumstances, when people have immunocompromised conditions, they can be more vulnerable to mold, so it's important to recognize. And then finally, what gets a lot of attention in the media and elsewhere on the Internet and so forth is the potential toxic effects of mold. It is known that molds can produce mycotoxins, as Dr. Karavanos mentioned. To what extent those mycotoxins in indoor air, through breathing primarily inhaled spores, can cause toxic effects is not really well established and is somewhat speculative, and we'll talk more about that. So the allergic responses that people can have to mold are, again, this typical hay fever sort of response where people can experience itchy, watery eyes, runny nose, nasal congestion. It can also produce a cough if there's post-nasal drip. So mostly respiratory. Then also some people can have a more what we call systemic response with skin symptoms like eczema or itchy sort of a rash. We don't think that rashes from contact with mold are very common. We don't really see that. But, again, one could have an eczematous type of a rash. And then more rarely, quite unusual, is that with high-level exposure, certain individuals may have a condition, develop a condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is caused by inhalation of mold spores or mycelial fragments that then, upon depositing in the lungs, cause a local immune response in the lungs. So it's not, again, an infection, but an immune response, an allergic type response to the mold material, to proteins in the mold. And that can be more serious and can lead to a condition that is sort of a flu-like illness that recurs on repeated exposure to the mold, gets better when the person's away from the mold exposure, worsens when they return. And then over time, this can be potentially serious 
and that it can cause um, damage to the lungs over time uh, if it's not treated or if the person's not removed from the exposure. And then finally, fungal sinusitis is another condition that is very uh, somewhat controversial in that individuals can have fungus growing in the sinus cavities. And again, it's not an infection. It's what we call colonization where the fungi uh, can be present in the sinuses, but it's not invading the tissues of the body and causing an infection. So again, so allergic rhinitis, again, is these hay paper type symptoms, uh, runny nose, nasal congestion, itchy, watery eyes, and then potentially a cough from post-nasal drip. And it's allergic responses to protein in the mold. And only some uh, individuals are sensitive. Uh, this type of reaction, uh, people have to be sensitized through prior exposure, in this case, to the mold proteins. And then when they're subsequently exposed again, and this could be for the rest of their lives, when they're subsequently exposed, they will have this uh, allergic rhinitis type response. And it's estimated that only about 10% of the population will have this sort of response. And people who are allergic to mold are typically a, an allergic type person. So we call it atopy, which is a condition in which people are uh, more likely to primarily through heredity, through their uh, family history. Uh, typically, they're likely to have mold, uh, likely to have exposure, likely to have allergies to many different types of uh, exposures in addition to mold. And then allergy is an all or none type of response uh, in that um, it's not a dose response. It's not like typically that a little bit of the allergen uh, causes a small response and a lot more causes a much larger response. Uh, that typically people who are allergic can respond to very low levels of the allergen, whereas people who are not allergic can be exposed to very high levels and not have any type of allergic response. Um, and it's not clear what type of protein in different molds causes the allergic response. And it's also not clear in most cases uh, which mold is causing the response. So as Dr. Carabanos mentioned, many different types of mold will grow indoors. In any particular uh, building, any particular home where mold is growing, we typically find many different species. And identifying which one is causing the allergy is often not possible and usually not really important because the idea is that if someone's having allergic response to mold, that they avoid the exposure and identifying which particular mold species it is is not so important. Uh, another important uh, fact about mold exposure and allergy is that even the non-viable spores, even spores that uh, may have been uh, released a long time ago by the mold and are now uh, not, not capable of reproducing and germinating, that those spores still have the proteins that can make people allergic. So resuspension of those spores, uh, getting, getting them into the air, and then breathing that uh, material, breathing uh, the uh, resuspended spores can cause people to have an allergic response. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's important to consider the fact that most allergic type responses to mold, the allergic rhinitis, other responses, are temporary and reversible. So it's a condition that we'd like to avoid. And certainly if people have more serious types of allergic responses like allergic asthma, which I'll mention next, uh, then obviously we want to take uh, measures to avoid those types of exposures. But that once someone's removed from a mold, if they're allergic and sensitive to the mold, that they should not be continuing to have allergic type uh, symptoms. Uh, on the other hand, we are concerned though that if people have prolonged exposure to mold, uh, in cases where uh, they're exposed over time, there appears to be, from what we know, an increased likelihood that someone may develop new allergies from those exposures, including new allergic asthma. Uh, and there's growing evidence indicating that that may be uh, a more serious potential outcome, again, of long-term exposure to mold. So allergic responses uh, to, as to, uh, aller to uh, mold include asthma, as well as the hay fever, allergic rhinitis type response. Uh, and uh, most asthma is allergic, uh, but again, only those individuals who have asthma 
who have particular sensitivity to mold are likely to have these uh, asthma attacks or worsen asthma from the mold exposure. Again, even uh, people who have asthma may be more sensitive to other effects of mold, such as irritation as well. But in terms of the allergic response, uh, it's, it only occurs in people that are sensitized to mold. And, and in general, in the general population, only about 10% or so of people uh, we believe are sensitive to mold. Uh, so breathing mold spores can cause a, asthma attack. Again, prolonged exposure to mold in someone who hasn't had asthma before or isn't sensitized to mold may lead to that new sensitivity and potentially new asthma as well. And again, there, there's growing evidence that that may occur in, in some individuals with longer-term exposure. So as I mentioned, hypersensitivity to pneumonitis is another type of allergic response. And this is caused by inhalation of mold spores or mycelial fragments that get deeper into the lung. And then when they're deposited there, cause an allergic type response in the lung. Uh, this is quite rare uh, in terms of seeing it in association with any indoor exposure to mold. There have been some reports in, in the medical literature. Uh, it's known more widely in terms of occupational exposure, such as among agricultural workers who may breathe large quantities of moldy and other organic dust material. Uh, but in terms of indoor air exposure, it's a possible hazard, something we may be concerned about and has been reported. And again, in this case, people will experience uh, allergic, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, flu-like uh, illness that recurs with exposure and that once they're removed from the exposure, uh, the response, the, the illness, goes away, and then when they return, it can reoccur. And it's experienced, again, as a recurrent flu-like uh, sort of illness, which over time is potentially serious. So it's important to diagnose it and identify the cause so that the person can be removed from that exposure. And then finally, among the allergic type responses, uh, fungal sinusitis has been a concern, and there's been reports that fungi may be an underlying uh, cause of chronic sinusitis. And in some cases, there are actually uh, diagnoses of, of the growth of fungus inside the sinus cavity in the form of uh, fungus, what are called fungus balls. But again, those are not invading uh, the, the sinus tissue and are typically a colonization. Uh, in people who are uh, immune compromised for a variety of reasons, one can have infections, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, but in this case, the response is more of a colonization and an allergic type response to the mold. So in a, continuing then with the types of responses that one can have in terms of health effects of mold, uh, irritation responses uh, we see reported commonly in that people feel irritation, in the eyes, nose, throat, uh, irritation of the lungs, which can then lead to cough and other symptoms. And it's not clear in those cases often what it is about the mold exposure that's causing that type of a response. As Dr. Caravanos mentioned, mold can produce volatile organic compounds, often referred to as MVOCs or mold VOCs, some of which we know at high, high concentrations can cause irritation. Whether or not the levels that are commonly encountered in indoor air in a moldy situation, reach those types of levels that could cause irritation is not clear. Uh, there are other compounds in mold uh, in the spores and the mycelial fragments themselves, such as beta-glucan, which is a component of the mold uh, cell wall that we know can be inflammatory uh, to the mucous membranes, to the lining of, of these tissues. So it certainly, uh, although we may not be, again, able to identify the exact cause, we certainly do see many patients who have irritation and inflammation type uh, symptoms that don't appear to be allergic when they're exposed to mold. But again, similar to the allergy type response, these types of responses are expected to be reversible uh, and not cause permanent damage. Unlike allergy type responses, we think that these types of responses do not, uh, do, do have a dose response type uh, of uh, relationship between the amount of exposure and the, uh, and the health effect that people experience. Uh, 
So at high levels of irritating compounds from mold, it's possible that everyone can have a response, an irritation-type response. And it's not just certain sensitive individuals. Although, again, individuals will vary in their sensitivity to irritant-type responses, just as they will for allergic-type responses. So infection is, I think, a concern that people may have because mold is classified as a microorganism, and I think people associate uh, microorganisms with disease as pathogens, as uh, organisms that can grow in, 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 inside the body and cause damage. But the, the fungi that grow inside homes are not those that usually cause infections. So, you know, certainly there are fungi that cause superficial infections, uh, athlete's foot, for example. Uh, those are not the kinds of fungi that grow indoors. The kind of fungi that um, can cause disease by growing in the body uh, are adapted to, to again, living on uh, or, or growing on non-living uh, materials, and our body's immune system is very well equipped to prevent the invasion of those types of fungi into the body and causing, causing an infection. Um, in certain circumstances, though, when individuals are, uh, have immune impairment uh, due to having, for example, HIV infection, uh, anti-rejection drugs that they may be taking after an organ transplant or uh, bone marrow transplant, for instance, uh, or having inherited or acquired immune deficiencies, which are relatively rare, that those individuals have to take special precautions to avoid exposure to molds, and that there are some types of species, such as Aspergillus, which are particularly, they are, they're common species of mold, often found indoors, but they can cause infections in people that, again, uh, have impaired immunity. Uh, but it's more of a function of the person's susceptibility and immune impairment rather than exposure to mold. What I mean by that is that Aspergillus species are uh, everywhere in the environment. They're normally found in decomposing plant matter outdoors, such as uh, leaf litter and compost, uh, and we can find them, as Dr. Caravanos mentioned, at times in levels of thousands or tens of thousands of spores per cubic meter outdoors, especially in certain seasons. Uh, so people that are more susceptible to having these types of infections uh, will often get them regardless of the fact that there may be somewhat more or less exposure to mold under certain circumstances. Uh, but again, it's important to be careful to avoid excessive exposure when people have these sort of conditions that make them more vulnerable. So finally, I wanted to talk about toxic responses to mold. It's well known, it's well established that certain species of mold can produce toxic substances and that those toxic substances can then cause a health effects in animals as well as in humans. Uh, molds produce these types of mycotoxins uh, basically to defend themselves. Uh, through adaptation, through evolution, uh, mold can't run away uh, from its, uh, its enemies. It can't uh, fight back, but it can release uh, chemicals, toxic substances that can protect it. Uh, so an, one common example are the antibiotics that are produced by certain mold species. So penicillin, for example, from penicillium species, which is a toxic compound to bacteria, fortunately not to human beings, and actually we all know that it's a very important uh, type of medication uh, that can help to protect our health. On the other hand, there are toxic substances that are produced by mold that can be toxic to human beings and other uh, mammals, other animals. And, and most of our experience with this is from exposure to animals from eating moldy grain uh, or other moldy materials where animals can get acutely ill from that. But we also know that there are some types of uh, mycotoxins such as aflatoxin, which is found, again, in moldy grain and in, in peanuts, for example, uh, which are found in our food supply, in, our, in, in the food chain at, at very relatively low levels. But we know that when they get higher, in certain circumstances, they increase the risk, in the case of aflatoxin, of, of cancer. It causes liver cancer. Uh, 
And that has led, I think, some, to some concern that if molds cause uh, or molds produce these toxic substances that can then have very serious health effects like cancer and other uh, health effects, that, that inhaling mold, then moldy sp spores from mold, that that can then cause those types of serious health effects, which include not only cancer but also neurotoxic effects, uh, effects on the nervous system, other effects perhaps on the kidney in certain experimental conditions or in animals. Uh, but the, the extent to which those types of exposures to indoor mold, uh, to breathing what in aggregate, although, although 10,000 or 100,000 mold spores uh, is obviously a lot, large number of spores in a cubic meter of air, and we may breathe 10 or 20 cubic meters per day, uh, so something on the order of a million mold spores perhaps one could breathe in a very, very moldy environment that a million mold spores would sort of fit on the head of a pin and it's a very small amount of material and that if mycotoxins are present and they're not always present uh, in mold at different times and depending on the different species and the different growth conditions, that even if four mycotoxins were present, that it's only a, a small fraction of that material. So the question is whether or not very, very small amounts of mycotoxins that one might inhale whether those can actually cause um, a, high, a, a serious risk of a health outcome. Um, and so in those cases, uh, we don't know uh, for sure what the exact risk is, but we think it's probably very small uh, because, again, it's a small amount of exposure uh, in terms of, you know, the, the total amount of material that one might be inhaling. And there haven't been any, any proven studies or demonstrations that inhaling indoor mold spores can have these sort of effects, uh, more serious effects. But it's something that, again, it's an area that we don't know uh, everything about and we want to be cautious and eliminate and reduce exposure when we can uh, and take reasonable steps to avoid exposure. Um, but it's an open question as to whether or not uh, small amounts of airborne spores and mycotoxins can actually harm uh, human health. Uh, but, it, but it's important to take a conservative approach and avoid exposure where we can. So if, um, if one does experience symptoms or have exposure and one is concerned about uh, symptoms, whether they be allergic type symptoms or other symptoms that one might experience, irritation symptoms or other symptoms, uh, it's important to see your personal uh, health care provider. Um, Often healthcare providers aren't experts in mold exposure, uh, but they can treat, especially if one has an allergic type response, uh, appropriately, symptomatically treat the exposure. Um, they can also refer you to specialists, uh, such as uh, pulmonologists or allergists uh, for further evaluation, or, for, or to occupational and environmental physicians, uh, such as we have at the, OC, at the environmental uh, health clinic at EOC. Um, and you should then tell your provider about what the conditions of the exposure were, uh, including results of any kind of testing that was done or inspection results, and also uh, details about the relationship between the symptoms you may be experiencing and, and mold exposure. So important questions include, do the symptoms occur in relationship to the exposure? So in terms of time and, and location, do they occur within minutes or hours of exposure when you, when you leave the location, whether home or workplace? Uh, do the symptoms go away? Do they get better on extended periods of time away from home, such as on vacation or away from work on the weekend? Um, and these could be important uh, questions for establishing the relationship between the exposure and, and the health effect. Uh, and then other issues about uh, individual susceptibility are important. So the physician would want to know whether you have a history of allergies, again, because allergy to one substance makes you more likely to be allergic to other things. Uh, and in particular, whether you have a history of being sensitive to mold in the past. And this could be either by your report of symptoms or by prior allergy testing that an individual might have had. And then other uh, explanations for symptoms are important. So other conditions that might mimic the symptoms that might be associated with mold, 
such in this season, for example, you know, a lot of co common colds, uh, perhaps the flu may be going around. So there, there's a possibility in, every, in any case, really, when people are having short-term exposure uh, to mold and having symptoms, that it could be coincidentally that they're having uh, other uh, medical conditions causing their symptoms. Uh, so again, um, there could be an allergy to something other than mold as well. So when one is exposed to mold in a moldy environment, there may be also exposure uh, to uh, other cleaning compounds, for example, uh, chlorine bleach or other disinfectant compounds that people may be using. Uh, there can be also other exposures to uh, other materials that might be in floodwaters, for example, that be, could be causing irritation and perhaps it's not mold. Uh, and then in order to evaluate further the relationship between uh, mold exposure and to diagnose any conditions that might be related, a physician might do further tests such as lung function tests or breathing tests to measure pulmonary function. That can be helpful in terms of diagnosing asthma or asthma exacerbation. Uh, X-rays or CT scans of either the chest or in the case of uh, pulmonary uh, conditions or the sinuses in the case of uh, sinusitis can be diagnostic tests that a physician may recommend. Allergy testing can be helpful in terms of establishing that someone is an allergic type person in general as well as in more unusual cases identifying particular molds that might be of interest but often uh, because molds are, um, uh, there are many molds found indoors and there are many molds that one could test for and the fact that the proteins in molds that are used to do either blood test or skin prick testing are not well standardized, it can be very difficult to, again, to identify which particular molds are causing someone to be sensitive. And in most cases, it's not really so important to know that. Uh, and then finally, I think a question that many patients have is whether or not there is a test either in blood or in urine that can measure one's exposure to mold, especially quantifying one's present or past exposure. There are some tests that have been reported and in, in primarily in medical and scientific literature, but there are not established clinical tests for measuring uh, mold materials such perhaps as mycotoxins or other mold uh, compounds in blood or, or urine or their metabolites. There are tests that can be done to measure those things in certain circumstances, but the, the appropriate uh, standard, the, the health, the normal level, the level that of concern uh, for any of these compounds is not established. So it's generally not a useful uh, test. Uh, in some studies, uh, tests that have been done in the general population, for for example, some mycotoxins in blood or urine have shown that almost everyone has detectable levels. And again, it's primarily from the fact that there is small amounts of these compounds in, in the food supply in, in, uh, in grains that are found there naturally, again, from uh, moldy materials that can get into the, into the food supply uh, to some extent. And that's regulated by the USDA and so on. Um, but that to, to differentiate between the amount of those mycotoxins or metabolites of mycotoxins in blood or urine from the background exposure that we have from other sources is not possible at the present time. So finally, uh, it's very important to prevent uh, un uh, un unnecessary exposure to mold because that can prevent all of the uh, types of conditions or health concerns that we've talked about. So proper mediation is important. Uh, removal from exposure under conditions where there's high level exposure, uh, reducing and controlling exposure through use of personal protective equipment, uh, especially if one is doing uh, remediation uh, on one's own in, in one's home for small amounts of contamination, um, or if others are uh, doing remediation in the area uh, that there's a higher potential for exposure during activities that disturb the mold and release mold spores or mycelial fragments, and that it can be especially important in those circumstances to use personal protective equipment, such as N95 respirators, to reduce exposure inhalation uh, of mold spores. Uh, 
Uh, and then finally, uh, to consult with your health care provider about specific treatments for mold-related conditions. Uh, because again, uh, allergy and asthma exacerbation, and particularly asthma exacerbation, can be very serious, but that can be treated uh, medically uh, and in addition to reducing and removing oneself from the exposure. Uh, there are important treatments that can uh, shorten an exacerbation of asthma, for example, and also treatments for allergies that are quite effective. So in summary, exposure to mold by inhalation can cause uh, more commonly allergy and asthma attacks in some people, irritation of the eyes, nose, and throat. We expect these sort of reactions to be reversible in that when someone is removed from the exposure, one should get better. Uh, rarely, People can have responses such as hypersensitive pneumonitis, uh, conditions such as fungal sinusitis. Uh, and again, that happens rarely in individuals that are more susceptible. And, and finally, infection even more rarely in people who are immune compromised. And then the toxic type responses are an area where it's questionable whether or not indoor exposure to mold is a serious cause of toxic type responses in individuals. But it is an open question, and we should be cautious, cautious about exposure and try to, try to reduce exposure to the extent practical. Uh, and then finally, diagnosis made by the history of exposure response relationship, uh, ruling out other conditions, specific medical tests that can be helpful for differentiating conditions, and of course, uh, again, avoiding or reducing exposure is the mainstay for both prevention and treatment of mold-related health conditions. So thank you, and I think now we'll entertain any questions. Thank you.